Hi, everyone. Welcome. Good morning, good afternoon, wherever you're joining us from. Um, my name is Cindy Sego. I am the program coordinator for the National American Indian Alaska Native PTTC. Thank you for joining us in our listening session. Um, I do see a lot of familiar faces. Today we have Marie from our sister center, the Samsa Travel TTA Center, who will be um, leading us in our session. Um, so I will start by doing a brief introduction. Um, our center, the National American Indian Alaska Native PTTC, is funded by SAMHSA, and we are part of the PTTC network. Uh, with 10 regional centers and three national centers, a national coordinating office in Kansas City, and also the National Hispanic and Latino PTTC. Um, so although this um, content is, um, and our project is sponsored by SAMHSA, um, the content is developed by the presenter and all opinions do not necessarily express the views of SAMHSA and the PTTC. After this session, uh, we would have the recording of the session posted on our website. Um, you can also request CEUs for this session. So please send me an email at cindy.sego at uiua.edu. Um, you would also have the information on how to request CEUs in the follow-up email. We would also have our evaluation survey at the end of this um, session. So please take time to fill it out and we'll also have information about that in the follow up email. Um, so, although we are gathered here virtually, uh, we would like to take the time to acknowledge and pay respect to the land and indigenous nations whose lands were forcefully taken and inhabited. Uh, so, please take time to just think about this, we do have a land acknowledgement on our website and we would also put, um, we would also send this information and you can check it out there. So thank you so much to start our session in a good way. I would like to call on Marie to introduce herself and um, lead us in an opening blessing, if that's okay, Marie. So go away, so go away. So good afternoon, everyone. My name is Marie Schuyler Drever, and I am a member of the Oneida Nation of the Thames out in Ontario, Canada, as well as uh, I come from the Little Traverse Bay Band of Adawa Indians out in Northern Michigan on my mother's side. And I work with the Training and Technical Assistance Center with SAMHSA underneath Tribal Tech. And I am a technical and training assistant. Today, I will be providing you all with a overview of some digital stories that we have worked on as an organization. Some of my colleagues uh, specialize in digital storytelling and I wanted to take the opportunity um, in our series and share this with you. It's called Culture is Prevention. And I have a couple of other videos that I'd also like to share that resonate to that highlight. Um, for today, I would just like to acknowledge, as Cindy had shared, the lands that we all, whether that's um, you're in the local area with where Cindy and Natasha are, or whether you are in your home territories, is to take the moment and I'd like to just have a moment of silence for today in light of all that we as indigenous people are enduring while we are hearing of the latest news that's coming about to all people uh, finally that are hearing our cries that we've had regarding to our Indian residential schools, not just here in the United States, but as well as in Canada, the latest news there um, and of course here, I've known for many years that uh, we've had atrocities in our communities where these residential schools lie. I am a residential school's grandchild survivor and my grandparents have both 
um, on both sides of my family for generations had suffered. So I want to take a moment of silence today in honor of all of those. Thank you, everyone. And I'll pass this back over to Cindy. Thank you, Cindy. Thank you, Marie. Um, so I, of course, be um, just. I just want to acknowledge everyone who's here joining us um, again today for this session. Um, thank you for your time. Always joining us on at least once a month on Fridays. Um, I see Kevin. Thank you so much, Kevin, for always joining us, and Linda. Um, we also um, sometimes have members of our advisory council on these calls, but I do not see any uh, names right now. So um, I will pass on back to Marie um, to see how she would like to start the session. I know she has a couple of videos and messages for us, so looking forward to that. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, I'll go ahead and start share screening and I'll, we'll go through these videos. Two of them are of youth. Um, both of these youth uh, reside in Michigan. And then I have a couple of other videos that I'd like to share as well that come from um, some adults and all of their stories talk about resilience and how culture is that prevention. Thank you. My name is uh, Zachary Antoine Jackson. I'm 20 years old. I'm from the Saginaw Chippewa Indian tribe from Mount Pleasant, Michigan. And I'm a traditional dancer and I've been dancing since I was three years old. My mom and dad were the ones who brought me out into this circle and kind of introduced me to this way of life that you know, we were given. And I'm forever grateful for that because now it kind of shaped me into who I am today. It's also just kept me away from, you know, drugs and alcohol. I did grow up around it. My dad, he drank a little bit when we were younger. I've seen as a model of what not to do. Just never really had that kind of temptation there just because of my culture would always be there for me, you know, rather than resorting to other substances such as, you know, drugs and alcohol. People resort to that thing is to, to like make them feel good, you know, but you know, I don't, I don't need that because powwows are that kind of like escape for me. And uh, when you consume those substances, they, your feelings get put into what you do and you don't kind of want any kind of bad energy into something that was meant to be good, you know, such as dancing or like ceremonies or um, any kind of cultural thing that you're trying to do. Being sober was a choice that I made was um, not just for like, Follows and like my culture or whatever, but I just wanted to be a, a good role model for my younger siblings. You know, I've got two younger sisters and one younger brother, and you know, being that big brother, I just wanted to be someone that they they could look up to. You know, not just uh, my brothers and my sisters, but hopefully other youth in the community as well. You know, where I grew up here, in Mount Pleasant. Like I said, be someone people can come to and you know help them out and helping others. And, you know, there's other people who need help, so why not be that person to help them? You know, these are some pieces of my outfit that I brought with me. Um, some of my bigger pieces that have a lot of meaning to me are these pair of moccasins. These moccasins are actually my uh, my grandpa's moccasins. You know, it makes me happy knowing I got a piece of him uh, with me out there when I'm dancing. I hope that he knows that, you know, he's always on my mind when I'm when I'm dancing. So that's why I wear those is just for for my grandpa, you know, in honor of him. An old breastplate that my dad had, and he passed it on to me with um, different silver and brass pieces on there. And 
it's another thing too it's like um kind of showing you know that he's also a part of my outfit like this a piece of my dad with me you know you know he's one of the people who protected me when i was golden and that's what these best plates are is that they're armor and they're protectors it's part of me it's part of my dad and it's one of the pieces that keeps me safe I feel. and this otter was actually gifted to me from uh, my uncle delmer otters were kind of our protectors and you know that goes back to that piece that my dad was saying is that my uncles were kind of looking after me you know he said this, this otter will protect me these back pieces are it kind of shows you know that i'm, a, I'm an ojibwe person and these were actually one of the, the first pieces that I actually did myself. Putting good energy into what you wear is important. And Powell's have just been like a happy place for me. Not only myself, but hopefully for like others who watch me dance. Cause it's not just something for yourself, but it's for, it's for the people. So you dance for those who, who can't no more. You dance for those who are healing. Okay, thank you everyone. And now I will go to the next. Hello, my name is Tisa Pai, which translates roughly into Girl of the Moon. I am Lynx Clan, and I am First Degree Madu. All my life, I was fortunate enough to be raised in a family that was rich and strong in our Anishinaabe culture and traditions. I received my spirit name in my clan the night that I was born because my parents were told that I was sick with some serious medical conditions affecting my heart and brain. As soon as I was born, I was rushed to pick you. That time, the situation was very critical. I was born with congenital hydrocephalus, which also is referred to as water on the brain. So because of my hydrocephalus, I was told I was never going to learn how to walk or talk. Going through the hard times of unknown diagnoses and difficult and long surgeries and recoveries, I have never lost my tribal or spiritual identity. I have always realized how much, how high importance it is to know who you are and where you come from, especially in terms of blood memory. I come from a very long line of strong and resilient Anishinaabe and Medellin with all forms of diversity and inspiration. There are so many individuals within today's society that do not know the meaning of spirituality and many struggle. There is so much terrible disease like cancer and although it's not my particular story, I do have my fair share of tough times. Abstaining away from substance abuse is incredibly easy for me because I have a reminder every day of my great influences. I am reminded how much Medellin is within my family's bloodline, generations upon generations. 
If I wasn't a day one, I would go on living my life not knowing the truth of my ancestors and the ways in which they live. A day one means the way of the heart. And we believe in the continuous flow of everlasting life. The continuous flow of everlasting life, that means making sure that the past generations have get, left a good trail for the future generations. My day teachings mean a lot to me, not just spiritually, but physically as well. There are signs every day that I took the step that I was meant to take. The step I was meant to take was to become a day one and continue the ways in which my ancestors lived. And when we get initiated into the lodge to become a day one, we are healing the sick and gaining spiritual knowledge. So physically, my, my day one teachings have strengthened me by helping me to improve my health conditions. Spiritually, I attend ceremonies and I, my heart feels so full afterwards. And I will continue on the next portion. Generational trauma is very common in Native communities in rural Alaska. This topic is a very heavy, very emotional, and a huge burden among our Native people. The most common trauma we experience is due to alcohol abuse. When I was 11 years old, my mom passed away at the age of 49. Alcohol resulted in her death. She was sober for many years, but one day she started drinking to numb her unbearable pain. And my dad was left to raise six of us children with no choice but to add on the motherly duties. Despite his issues with alcohol, I grew up to admire the way he stepped up to the plate and took care of us all without any complaints. Being an 11 year old, I was quite traumatized. I became independent at such an early age while watching most of my friends enjoy their childhood without a worry in the world. At the age of 21, I welcomed my beautiful daughter into this world. Unfortunately, at the age of 22, my dad lost his battle to stage four prostate cancer and my life changed forever. I realized that I was turning to alcohol to numb my pain as my mother did. Being a young single parent is tough, but the love I have for my child, I realized I didn't want to put her through the same trauma I experienced. I made the decision to stop the cycle, and at times it is a struggle, but as days pass, it gets easier. It takes a lot of patience. Fortunately, my daughter gives me the courage to live a happy and healthy lifestyle. I want to inspire those who are struggling to seek help as I did by going to counseling every week for two years. Everybody experiences some sort of trauma in their lifetime, and I have learned that I am not alone. Healing is a long process, but it is not impossible. And I will go to our last video that I'll be sharing. Yeah. Hey.
I learned from my elders and my grandfather that when we return to our homeland, it is one of our traditional beliefs to eat a piece of earth or plant to help make our bodies immune to any sickness. And so we can also spiritually and physically readjust to our homeland. When we spend time on the tundra, doing activities like fishing, gathering driftwood, seal hunting, bird hunting, or gathering greens, it is therapeutic for our whole well-being. And I was taught to leave all my cares, worries, burdens, and frustrations to this land. When you do these healthy activities, it is a form of cleansing. When I return home, I am a new person. That is the way we meditate on this land. When we come back to our homeland, where we were born and raised, it is always a true healing. It is a really powerful healing because this land is where the Creator has put us, and we have dominion over everything, the rivers, the seas, and the land, and we know where to hunt and gather our resources. In our spirit, we are rich and have everything we need provided for us. It is really powerful to acquire and learn knowledge of the land and the sea and what it can provide for us. That is why we have values and traditional beliefs to help us where we are. We also have a great respect for our environment. Our nourishment from this land has always been part of our healing. Sometimes when people are away from their homeland and not eating their traditional foods, get into unhealthy habits of eating, which can lead to poor nourishment of essential nutrients within the body. Our traditional foods are naturally full of iron, calcium, and vitamin C. For example, the seal is rich in iron. The sand bears or cloud bears are rich in vitamin C. Even the needlefish is a great resource for calcium that many people do not eat today, but was essential for our survival in ancient times. Our people even have probiotics in the form of fermented and aged food sources. When someone is not feeling well, one can eat their traditional foods, which can help with the healing. I have seen this time and time again and have experienced this myself. This is what the elders and my grandfather taught me about our land and traditional foods. It is medicine for our people on a holistic level, for the mind, soul, and body. These ancient remedies or traditional ways of knowing have to be recorded and taught to the new generation so that they are not lost. Thank you, everyone, for participating and painting, um, directing your attention to our videos here that I had shared with everyone today. I chose these four videos, and I wanted to have some conversation. And if you have any questions or ans um, questions or concerns or um, information you would like to share, but one of the things that I wanted to mention out of each of these videos to you all is that the connection, the interconnectionness with each of them. And I'll start with Zachary and his was pertaining to powwow and how that was a form of healing for him. And then Priscilla sharing um, her health, her physical health and how ceremonies was a part of her healing. And then we go to Lucinda 
and her resilience and her own healing from her intergenerational historical traumas that she had went through. And then John at the end, bringing back traditional foods as a form of healing, both for our mind, body, and our spiritual. And so all of these interconnections share with us the healing. And so collectively, we're looking at healing in those four areas. And they're predominantly today, the four areas that we focus on when we're working in communities, whether it's our own community or as myself working in several different communities. Uh, I think it's important that we look at that and that's the resilience piece of healing. And so initially when I had thought about doing the presentation for you all today, I had thought about doing it with powwow. And unfortunately with COVID this last year, I, I felt that maybe powwow in the sense of the beginning and how this, how this was actually for, for Zach. Um, but then thinking about why we're here today on a virtual platform as opposed to being together face-to-face -to -face, um, and looking at the reasonings behind that being that it's the, the pandemic COVID and how resilience looks differently for all of us today. And for, for me personally, and I'll share with you all that these all were probably in the same, and, and the reason why I selected the videos in the manner in which I did in, in, in presentation is powwow. Initially, I was a powwow dancer a long time ago. That's where I met my husband. Um, I've been to ceremonies all my life. And once I left powwows, it, really took back into effect for me. And then the healing and resilience, as I shared at the beginning during the opening that I come from a long line of historical trauma through it, the Indian boarding schools, both on the Canadian side and the American side. And what that looks like, you know, growing up, I don't have to share that with many of you all because you've experienced that too. And lastly, traditional foods. I suffer with a few autoimmune diseases, a connective tissue disorder, and I found healing in our traditional foods. And so, although I wanted to share these all with you for the, the fact that they're healing and the resilience, but also how they've touched me and how in my lifespan, that that's how the videos that I played, that's exactly how it has been for me. Um, I, I don't powwow, I don't powwow dance anymore. Um, and hopefully I can attend a powwow someday soon. Um, for now, I'm, I'm completely content with where I'm at today in my traditional foods. And as John, John is a relative of my colleague, Valerie, um, as, he's, as he shared at the end there, um, it's medicine and it's healing and it's for our mind, bodies and spirit. And I truly believe that. So I want to end my conversation from my speech there with you all and to have um, some question and answers or concerns or conversation as best we can. Um, if you would like to utilize the chat box, I'm not asking anyone to come off mic if they're not comfortable. Um, we do have the, the chat box function available. If you'd like to raise your hand, um, we have that available to us and let me, let me kind of go through that. Um, we have the reaction button at the bottom. And if you click on that, it says raise hand that you can click on. And we can, Cindy, myself, or Natasha, we can go through and, and make sure that we're not missing anyone if you're using that function. Otherwise, like I said, you can go ahead and come off mic or you may put any comments in the chat box. Thank you all. Thank you, Marie. Um, those were such powerful videos, as uh, you know, as others have said in the chat box. And um, the stories, um, the messages are just so inspiring. 
um, I just wanted to, you know, start getting the conversation as others are probably thinking about how they're going to frame their own questions and comments. Um, and like you said, you know, culture is prevention, is healing. Um, the messages, um, the video shows, you know, the interconnection and the intergenerational uh, role culture has played um, in different age groups, youth, um, middle age, the elderly. And, you know, that was so powerful to see that it's not just um, the old people, as uh, I think it was John who said in his videos, you know, we need to get the young people um, not to forget their roots and to stay connected because, you know, like you said, this is healing for mind, body, and spirit. Um, the question, I think the first question I wanted to ask is, you know, I think we all know that our culture is prevention, but is there a way to summarize it? Um, you know, if somebody asked me, what do you mean by culture is prevention? What would be a good way to get them started to think more about it? Thank you, Cindy. Yeah, I think, and that's one of the reasons why I shared uh, these, why I selected these four videos to share with everyone is because culture looks differently to, to each of us. As I had said, I used to, I used to dance powwow and I no longer do. And so perhaps that might be different for me now than say when I was 20 and I was still dancing. And perhaps there's individuals that are looking or they are attending or they've been attending ceremony and how that actually is a is is culture uh and one of them that i i wish i had shared and i'm actually working on that piece with a colleague the colleague that puts these videos together for us on our communications team and it's language and language revitalization and that's really strong and connected for me um but that's another form of culture and resiliency is practicing our language. I know during this pandemic, if anything, um, it has allowed myself to really slow down with the busy stuff and focus in on the most important things that were important to me and my family. I have three children and that was language. And we've been able to participate in both my community's language programs that they've offered virtually, um, working month, monthly or weekly, um, attending monthly sessions of conversation talks, and then weekly sessions of class and learning uh, through Zoom. And so when I, when I think of culture, it's, it's those truly for us and in, in my household, it would be those five things. Um, we do still do powwow. My children dance. Um, my husband and our son, they participate in singing. And then ceremony, that's just been ingrained in us since I was young. And that's something that we do. And my husband as well. And so our children are raised that way. And then we look at healing. And I went through my own healing. And Lucinda's story really resonated with me because it's very similar to what I had gone through as far as the healing aspect of um, therapy and attending therapy. And I was fortunate enough to find an individual that was also indigenous. So my stories that I'd share in these sessions were understood and could be relatable uh, to the person I was seeking for therapy. And so that was really healing for me. And then we go into the traditional food aspect. And that is something that I've always had in my home with our traditional white corn, um, having corn soup growing up and cornbread and mush. And it's always been there. Wild rice coming from my mother's side and having wild rice always um, as a dish that we always had. However, um, individuals, and not everyone, um, but there's some individuals that didn't realize that those were our traditional foods because they grew up with the rations and the commodity cheese and the flour that was given to us by the government and not really understanding our true traditional foods. So it's really great to be able to share our traditional foods with our young people and to reclaim and 
understand those those for our body, mind, and spirit. And like lastly, I was saying the language aspect that's really important um, because if we don't have language, we don't have a culture. And where I stand with that is that language, our traditional indigenous languages have, if we try to translate into English, not always do we have that translation that's comparable or relatable to what the term actually means in our language. And so you have to really get to the ethnography of the language to understand a lot of times of what that looks like. And so it's really important for us to look at our traditional language and not always try to view it as, uh, what does it mean in English? What does it mean in English? Because it's really not going to have many times um, a relatable term. And so I appreciate your question and your comment there, Cindy. Thank you. Do we have any others that have come up? Yes, we do. Thank you for sharing that, uh, Marie. I see a question here from Kathleen or Kathleen. I'm sorry if I'm not pronouncing that right. Um, say, if young adults have not been part of their culture, is there a way to invite them to get involved? Yes, I encourage young adults to get involved. I, I have worked extensively in urban communities as I was raised in an urban community. I was raised in Metro Detroit, um, going back both to my mother's community and my father's community very often for cultural activities and ceremonies. And today, you know, when I'm working with youth and I'll have older youth come out and say, you know, I really want to know this, but my family's so disconnected. Um, this is where I come and it's usually an urban center. And I think that's a great beginning because that's the connection and the resource center for tying our communities to our urban communities. And it's important to start somewhere if you have that desire, if you're wanting that need, um, is to look, look to those resources around you that are attainable for you to get out to, whether it's, um, whether it's youth groups or culture camps that are held right there in the community where you reside. Um, and like I say today, you know, a lot of people are doing virtual sessions and they have virtual conferences for youth. And I think it's just really, that's, that's that connection that perhaps they start with is looking from the resources that are most attainable to them and easily available, which is close to the, wherever they're residing at the moment, whether that be away from their own community, but it is a connection. And sometimes you can connect the dots just by going in and asking. I know um, I have a friend that works in an urban center and that's predominantly what she does. She works with youth and bringing culture to them. Not always is it easy for them to get back home to be able to participate. Thank you for that question. Thank you for um, the response, Marie. Um, I think for me, one of the key things I got from that is that, you know, if um, a youth or youth are trying to get more involved and don't know where to start. It's, you know, looking to where they might be interested in. Um, youth groups and culture camps might have different activities that could, you know, start them up on that. So I think that that's a good um, place to start. And like you also said, you know, when it comes to culture, there's so much that it's culture. Our ceremonies, food, language, powwow, you know, dancing, it could be learning um, the native art and all of that. So I think that's a great place for you to start some, somewhere that they're comfortable with and then slowly grow into the others. So thank you for sharing that. Mm -hmm. I'm looking through the chat to see if we have any more questions, uh, comments. Alice says, when I teach master level social work students, it's always amazing to hear about the lack of knowledge on the history of indigenous peoples. They believe it is past. It takes a little while to get their attention and then they begin to hear the stories. 
Upon taking the course, they become angry about not knowing the realities of generational trauma, mental and physical health issues, cultural loss, languages, and importance of traditional foods for our peoples. Thank you for sharing that, Alice. Um, I think that's also something I've noticed um, with, you know, working with, um, uh, for me, you know, I, I, I come from um, West Africa, you know, I'm a member of a tribe there in Ghana, in West Africa, and moving to the US, um, I see a lot of similarities with um, the indigenous peoples here and my native people and the way we do things. But it was surprising to also see that there are a lot of non-indigenous peoples who didn't know that um, things like this exist. You know, they think it's in the past. And it's, um, it's an honor to be able to work with indigenous peoples and also non-indigenous peoples, um, helping them understand, um, to come to an understanding of why, you know, the culture is important, um, the indigenous culture is important and it's important that we keep it's um, going and resilient time. So thank you for sharing that, Alice. Um, any more questions or comments? This is Amber, can you hear me okay? Yes. Um, hi. So, um, yeah, so I'm indigenous to Mexico, and I found that out recently in the last year. And I'm wondering, the part that you were talking about with food and healing through food, are there any online resources if someone wants to, like, kind of discover more about that? Yes. Um, a lot of times there is an organization of the indigenous food sovereignty there is the an in, indigenous food um, alliance and i believe they have facebook pages they're on social media um, i'm not sure if i have the right name in that order but um, i think that's how you can find them a lot of times there is the the food alliance Indigenous Food Alliance is a big thing. They, I think they're about to have a conference coming up shortly. I think they're doing both a virtual this year and a present. Um, and that is usually in the Great Lakes area. This year, I'm not quite sure exactly where they're hosting that, but a lot of times you will hear of that, uh, of the different foods and that, that they are sharing. I would take a look on Facebook or social another social media site, Twitter, Thank you for the question. Thank you. You're welcome. Any, any more questions or comments? Okay, so someone says the National Museum of American Indian has a cookbook that you can purchase online. Oh, awesome. Any more questions? I um, have a question that is kind of a follow-up to the youth question. Um, someone asked about, you know, when youth uh, um, want get interested but do not have any cultural background. How about um, native youth that, you know, are not yet interested? How do we get them interested in our roots and our culture and their identity as native people? I don't know if uh, Marie can answer that question. I understand that it can become difficult, especially if we're urban and we're not in the community. I, uh, I suggest you just take them. And, but we can't for be forceful. So I have, I'll, I have a story and I'll share this with you. I have three children, as I stated, and they're very, uh, spaced and age. So I have my oldest is 22. My second oldest is 16 and my baby's eight. And my son is the oldest. He's 22 and he's very reserved, a very reserved young man, very respectful, very kind, very sweet boy. And one time when we were in Longhouse, that's where we attend our ceremonies. 
they were calling on, on young boys to come and they'll do that with different ceremonies. And that's the way our culture, my people integrate our young ones and teaching them is they just, they'll just go around and handpick them throughout, throughout the longhouse. And he would always attend. He'd always be there with me. And in our longhouse, our children sit with their mother. We're a very matriarchal community. And so my children, all three of them were sitting. I don't even know if I had my youngest at the time were sitting with me. And next thing I knew, he was like, I got to go to the washroom, mom. And I said, okay, well, go on. And he, he's, he leaves. And I was like, wow, he's really taking a long time. Where's, what is he doing? And so at the next kind of break, I guess you could say, I stopped and I went out to go look for him. And here he was in the van. And I said, son, what are you doing in the van? You're supposed to come back inside. And so he comes back inside. And then later the next, the next uh, day or that evening when we left, when it was over for the day, I asked him what happened. And he said, oh, nothing. He said, I just, I just, he didn't want to acknowledge it at first of what, but, you know, he got anxious. And I later found out that I couldn't hardly ever after that, get him to come inside. And he didn't want to be put on the spot. And so that's why I always be cognizant, even in here, you know, even in these um, forums of being able to use the chat. I don't want everyone, anyone to ever feel uncomfortable. And so I, I told him, I said, okay, well, you know, we're going to ceremonies and another time would come up. And he's like, okay. He's like, I'm just going to sit out here. I'm like, okay. And he'd sit outside and um, there's, you know, there's no air conditioning or anything in our longhouses. It's just fans and we have wood stoves and the windows are all open. And I would park close enough uh, to the building and um, he would just sit in the vehicle all day. And I have to appreciate that and respect that. Like, I understand that now he's probably too anxious to come in to be thought that he would be called upon to be, to do something um, and afraid that he would make a mistake or doesn't want to be seen as the one that's out there um, having to do anything or sing or have to um, go play lacrosse or, or play, play uh peach stone game or he, he didn't want any attention drawn to him. And so to avoid that, he stays in the vehicle. But I have to respect that. And so that's why I share, just take them because they will get that information. And even if they're sitting in the car um, and that's one thing too, is I wouldn't let him have anything while he sat in the car. Like he just had to sit there. He wasn't allowed to have a phone or, or whatever electronic game device he was out at that time. Um, but he just sat there and I'm really surprised today as to what he all knows being that he's only been sitting in the car um, all these years now, uh, that he's actually, he is paying attention and he is, he is grasping at something um, that's being shared with us, even if he's not sitting in there directly. And I think that's really important to pull out because I have my girls who are completely immersed in it and they love it. And they ask, you know, when can we go again? Are they, have they opened up again? Because our community, um, we have, we have a dying language. Our Oneida language has less than 80 mother tongue speakers remaining. And a lot of our clan mothers, faith keepers and chiefs are all elders. And so to keep them safe, we have not been in ceremony since last June. Last June was the last ceremony that we all were at together. And that was our strawberry ceremony. Um, our ceremonies are still being conducted, but only with those that are needing to be there, whether it be clan mothers, faith keepers, or our chiefs. And so they're taking care of the responsibility with just themselves. Um, so my girls have been asking, you know, when are when are we going back? When are we when do we get to go again? And so just being cognizant of that, and I'm just I'm ecstatic that they are just asking because I know not everyone is that eager to be a part of it. And so I just encourage you to just keep going, taking the youth, if that's your, if that is your job title as the youth coordinator or bringing cultural outreach to the community is just to continue to engage them because they are going to listen and they are getting, getting what we are sharing with them. They do hear. Thank you. Thank you, Marie. And I think, you know, if you take anything out of that, it's keep going, 
um, keep going. They, they are learning even though they appear like it's, um, they are not there. Um, so just keep going, don't give up. Thank you. Alice says, Marie, it sounds like you just described my son. He's very passionate about his indigeneity and doesn't talk, but doesn't talk in public. He hears and digests all the information. They may, they may appear distant, but, distant, but they're not. Thank you for sharing that, Alice. Um, see, we are almost at the top of the hour. We have eight more minutes. Um, I don't know if anyone has any more questions. If not, we would uh, look to close it in a good way. So we'll just wait for about a minute or so if anyone has any questions or comments. Or if Marie has any, you know, um, final um, message for us. Okay, all right. Um, if there are no more questions, um, just a brief summary of what we uh, discussed today. Um, we had very powerful um, messages from the videos. Uh, Kathleen, I'll ask Marie if it's okay to share those um, videos. Um, thank you. So we'll, we'll look to um, see if it, that's okay from the presenter. Um, yeah, so we had those powerful videos um, reminding us that our culture is prevention, our culture is healing. Uh, we talked about how youth are getting engaged and the way it's, um, it's interconnected, it's intergenerational, um, the impact of culture on our mind, body, and spirits, and how um, youth and elders can you know, influence others to be a part of um, the culture, the community, the ceremonies, and everything that encompasses our culture. Our culture is not one thing. Um, it's a group of different elements of our communities. And, you know, um, even if you just take one thing out of that, is that you, can, you have to keep going, um, getting the youths and everyone else involved. Um, so yes, thank you so much for sharing, Marie. I don't know if you are ready to close and if you, if not, if you could close us in a good way. Thank you. Yes, thank you. I was just gathering some of those. Um, I did find the Native Food Alliance. And so I shared that in the chat, the link for that. And there you will find a wealth of information. I'm sure there's links within their site. And so if you have any interest in the traditional foods, that is a good resource right there. They also, I know in the past, have given seeds away. My family actually acquired some of the seeds from our garden for last year uh, from this organization. So they are a very giving organization in resources and in um, actual seeds. So I, I highly encourage you all to, to check out the site that I just shared. And I think in closing, I wanna share something. I know we have an educator on that mentioned, I think it was, was it Alicia or Alice? I'm sorry, I can't remember the name. Um, and with students. So I wanted to share this. This is from one of my elders back home in, um, in Oneida. And he says, we saw you come from Europe. You brought your religion, that's yours. Nobody wants to take it from you. You brought your laws. Those are yours. Nobody wants to take it from you. But we didn't see you bring any land. So how did it become your land? And that's by Bruce Elijah, an elder from Oneida community and back in Ontario. And so I, I just wanna share that with you all. I'm in, um, encourage you all to, to take part in any of these that I've mentioned today, reach out if you have any questions. I will send the links for the videos to Cindy and Natasha and they'll be able to share those out um, 
and communication to you all with the links for the videos. And thank you, everyone. Thank you, Marie. Thank you for sharing your time and your knowledge with us. We really appreciate it. Thank you for sharing those beautiful stories. And thank you everyone for spending time with us this Friday afternoon or morning, <laughs> wherever you are. We look forward to seeing you next time. Have a great weekend. Nagitwa, bamapi.